Wow, welcome to chapter 18 of Acts. And since I don't totally know this from memory, <laughs> which I should, but I don't, you know, something about power of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem and Judea and the ends of the earth. I mean, I can get that part, and it's at the beginning of Acts, and if I really need to know it, I can go find it. Um, so let's read this together. This will help sink it into all of our memories. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Now it's interesting that this is now the second sermon that I get to do in the book of Acts. And you would think that seeing this, you know, I'd come up with the same thing every time when I read it. But because there's more in God's word than you can read in just one sitting, I just, just had this thought. Okay, you've seen the, the Got Milk shirts? If I had one, I would have worn it, but I don't. Imagine that I've got a shirt on that says, got power? I mean, have you ever felt like you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you? Have you ever felt like you had kind of a power shortage or power drain or there wasn't enough? And so you start thinking, man, where am I going to get the power? Well, okay, sometimes the disciples, they were all praying together, and the Holy Spirit just came down. And I've been there one time when that happened, and I'm telling you, you want to be there for that. That is just flooring. Um, there are spots and acts where people have laid hands on other people and then they've received the Holy Spirit. And now before everyone runs to the door, I don't think we're going to do that this morning either. Um, we're going to go to what lines up with my personal experience. And before I read this, uh, I've got to explain some Greek. And I know this because other people have explained it to me and I believe them. And so in Greek, there are extra verb tenses that we don't have in English. And one of them is, it's an action that starts now and continues on into the future. So like ask up there would be ask and keep on asking. So I'm going to read it the way the Greek means it. And then we'll talk about this in a second. So Jesus is saying, I say ask and keep on asking and it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door, the door will be opened. Now, a lot of times we stop right there because we're thinking about, I don't know, buying a car, buying a house, getting a job. Um, we know someone that's not a Christian, and, and we want that for them. And we use this as a, you know, Keep banging on the door so God will do something. And that is actually biblical because you can look up the, the parable of the, uh, the widow and the unjust judge. That was God's whole point. This is the same thing again, but he goes on a little bit more this time. He says, which of your fathers, if your son, or in my case, daughter, asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? So if your kids are asking for something good, you're not going to give them something that's going to hurt them. Of course not. So if you, though you were evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So if you're feeling a power shortage, got power? If the answer is no, just ask. It's there, and, and this is how it worked in my life, and we'll, we'll get back to that later. So we're in Acts, and in chapter 15... Uh, Paul delivered a letter up to Antioch, and then he went into Galatia in chapter 16 and visited some of the places that he'd already been, uh, building the relationships that were already there and expanding them. And he keeps trying to go here and trying to go there, and the Holy Spirit keeps saying, nope, not there, nope, not here, not over there. Finally, he gets this vision of a guy from Macedonia and says, hey, come over here and help us. So at the end of chapter 16, he heads to Macedonia in 17, works his way through Macedonia, gets down to Athens, and here at about half of chapter 18 is that tiny little yellow arrow. And Paul leaves Athens and goes to Corinth. Now, Corinth is a really interesting place uh, at this time in history. It's about 200,000 people. Uh, it had been leveled a few centuries before and then rebuilt. I've got my years all confused. I can't remember if it was 50 or 150 years ago. But the Romans decided that this was going to be a Roman town and they were going to establish it. And it's on these north, south, and east, west sea trade routes. So kind of going this way, 
and kind of going that way. And the reason is, if you're a sailor, it's dangerous to do this. This is a lot better deal. I guess you get to live longer. And if you're a mariner, that's probably pretty important. So there's a lot of trade going on. So there was this guy named Horace, a Roman guy named Horace. And apparently, if you're old enough and dead enough, you only need one name. And so Horace called it a place where only the tough survive. So if you kind of think, you know, Wild West and only the tough survive, and then read about some of the issues that the Corinthians were dealing with in Paul's letters to the Corinthians, it might make a lot more sense. But in any case, Paul gets there and he meets a Jew named Aquila and his wife Priscilla. And they're in Corinth because Claudius Caesar had kicked all of the Jews out of Rome. And the reason that that happened is because, actually we've read in Acts, you know, the, the, Paul goes to the synagogue and he preaches to the Jews and some of the Jews get converted. And then some Gentiles get converted and then all of a sudden the rest of the Jews that didn't get converted get jealous and there's a big uproar and then they get kicked out. And we kind of see this over and over and over again. Well, there is actually a writing from way back talking about uh, Jews and Acrestus that were causing problems, and that's why all the Jews got kicked out of Rome. So not only that, it also tells you that the gospel had made it to Rome and come back all the way to here. Let's see, do we have Rome on the previous slide? No, see, Rome's even farther away than that. It's like, you know, off there on the ceiling someplace. It's come all the way back down to Corinth uh, with... Aquila and Priscilla. So Paul is a tent maker. And so he starts working with Priscilla and Aquila because apparently Paul has run out of cash. He can't support himself anymore. And so he starts to work and then reason with the Jews in the, in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And we've got a pastor actually that is doing that right now and is supporting himself so that he can continue to be a pastor here. And so a question that I've got for all of this is, are we willing to do what it takes to spread the gospel? Are we willing to switch from our plan A to go to God's plan C and do what it is that he wants us to do? Paul was. And God also knows where our heart's at, and he also knows that he wants his kingdom to spread. So Silas and Timothy show up from Macedonia. And the Macedonian churches, we learned in the letter to 2 Corinthians, had sent Paul money so that he could devote himself exclusively to ministry, so full-time now. And you kind of wonder why it is that this happened. Well, again, back in the let both letters to the Corinthians, you get the idea that it was important for Paul in his ministry to the Corinthians to be able to offer it free of charge. And he even talks about this in his letters is he's trying to <laughs> straighten them up and get them headed in the right direction because they are all over the map if you read the letter. And it gives them a place to stand and say, you know what, guys? I brought you this gospel free of charge. Even though I could have gotten money from you to support myself, I didn't do that. And I don't want to do that ever because I want to be able to speak into your life as one who's got a real relationship with you that's not based on funding or anything else I want to be able to tell you how it is that you should live because I love you. And so we see the, the relationships playing out here. And, of course, kind of the usual things happen. The, the Jews in the synagogue oppose Paul. They become abusive. And so Paul says, okay, forget it. Your blood be on your own heads. I've tried to tell you. I'm going next door. So Paul goes all the way next door, which is an unusually short trip for Paul and goes to the house of Titus Justice. And even Crispus, one of the synagogue leaders in his whole household believe in the Lord. And the Corinthians are believed and are baptized. Now, at this point, this is usually when Paul either gets beat up or thrown out, or beat up and thrown out. I mean, we've seen this a lot. Instead, God comes to Paul and speaks to him in a vision. And he says, Paul, don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one, no one is going to attack you and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul does something else unusual. He stays in Corinth for a whole year and a half. 
I mean, Paul's MO so far has really been place to place to place to place to place, and I'm sure he stays days and weeks, but not a year and a half. He stays for a year and a half teaching them the word of God because he knows that God's got his back and God has told him what to do. And so listening to the Holy Spirit and knowing that you are where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to do, is a really good, good place to be. And Paul is. Now, well, you knew that the other shoe was going to have to drop sometime because this is the spreading of the gospel we're talking about. And quite honestly, if there isn't resistance someplace, um, odds are pretty good you're not doing the right thing. So Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, and the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charge, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. You think, big whoop. You know, why does Gallio care? Well, for one thing, it's interesting that Gallio is the one hearing this case, because this guy's got connections back to Claudius Caesar, the guy that kicked all the Jews out. And he's got to connections to another famous dead Roman guy named Seneca that you may have heard of. And so he's like, you know, in the upper end of the upper end that's hearing this case. And what they're really saying is that back in the Roman world, if you wanted to practice a religion, you had to have state, spon not state sponsorship, you had to have state approval to practice your religion. And Judaism was one of the approved religions. So what the Jews are really saying is, is this guy has gone completely off the reservation. He doesn't have anything to do with this anymore. He's doing something that's completely different. And you need to stop it because, you know, you're the proconsul and that's your job. You know, judge this thing and make it stop because this is not us. And so Paul gets ready to speak. And I'm sure would have gone on to say how that, no, actually, this is us. This is the fulfillment of what the Jews have been waiting for. But he doesn't even get a chance. Gallio says, you know, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions and words and names in your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such thing. And he kicks them out. And then the crowd goes and beats up one of the other synagogue leaders who apparently brought this whole thing to him. And so instead of Paul being the guy that get, gets beat up, it's actually his accusers that do, because, you know, if you go back a couple slides, God says, and no one is going to attack and harm you. Now, if, you know, I was like the odds maker guy in Vegas, um, yeah, that's a pretty bold statement to make right there. But, no, no one attacks and har harms him. Gallio kicks him out. So... Oh, I got to read because this was just not fitting on one slide very well. You knew that the yellow arrow had to get a whole lot longer or this wouldn't be axed. So Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time and he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. So here you see these relationships. Paul has built this relationship with Priscilla and Aquila and they're on his ministry team now. And oh, by the way, Silas and Timothy are on Paul's ministry team. I mean, we hear about Paul, 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 Paul and everything he does. Paul is not doing anything alone. He does it with people and with important people. I mean, he even calls them helpful in some of his letters to the other churches. I mean, man, how do you like to be called helpful by Paul? That's pretty cool. So he takes Pris Priscilla and Aquila come with him. And before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centrea, that's that little port thing down there before Corinth, because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila and he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. And then he set sail from Ephesus. And now you're thinking, wait a minute, on several levels. Uh, what's the vow thing? Why was Paul in such a hurry? I mean, since when does Paul get in a hurry to go anywhere? Um, scholars have a couple theories on those. And if you want to know, to know about them, talk to me after church, because we don't have enough time here to do that. The important thing is, is I think, wait a minute, he left Priscilla and Aquila behind. I thought they were part of the team. They are part of the team. Paul needed to go on. Some of his team stayed to minister in Ephesus. And so when Paul landed at Caesarea, he went, down, went up, which is north, and, or no, it's down. Anyways, when he landed at Caesarea, he went up, 
which is down to Jerusalem, greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch, which is north. Okay, got it. Yeah, I know. It's up and down the mountain, not up and down the map, which is just phenomenally confusing for me. But in any case, after spending some time in Antioch, Paul sets off and travels back through Galatia and Phrygia. It doesn't say it on the map, but Phrygia is just to the left of Galatia, strengthening all the disciples. So he's going around, and I don't really think that the map looked like this. I think it probably looked more like that because he's going around and building and strengthening and making new relationships. And so I've been hammering relationship, relationship, relationship here. You can see why it's really important because... At some point, the Galatians kind of got off track. Remember, there was that whole letter that got sent up to Antioch in chapter 15 about you don't have to follow every single little thing in the law. Just, you know, stay away from sexual immorality and food sacrifice to idols. You know, and then remember the poor. You know, that was all that was in that letter. Well, apparently some of the you got to follow all the stuff in the law bit got up into Galatia. So Paul writes Galatians, and he's got two whole chapters talking about how it is that following the law isn't going to work, and they need to stop that. And it kind of comes to a climax at the beginning of chapter 3 of Galatians. So because of Paul's relationship with these people, he can say, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law? or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Listen, someone that really knows you can talk to you like that. And sometimes we need to talk to each other like that and just say, what are you doing? And sometimes it's just more by way of encouragement. If you read some of Paul's other letters, um, I'm going totally off script, but to the Thessalonians, you know, he was only able to stop there just a little bit. And so when he writes them later, it's like, wow, I'm really glad to hear that you're continuing to follow God because I was there such a short time. I wasn't sure how this was going to work out, but this is awesome. But it's these relationships that Paul's built that gives him a place to talk from. Well, in the meantime, there's a Jew named Apollos, and he comes to Ephesus. And remember, Priscilla and Aquila got left behind? Well, Apollos is there. He's a learned man. He has a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He's been instructed the way of the Lord, speaks with great fervor, and teaches about Jesus accurately, but he only knew about the baptism of repentance from John, not the baptism of life in the Spirit through Jesus. And so Priscilla and Aquila hear him and take him under their wing and explain the rest of it to him that he's missing. So you see these relationships kind of cascading down to different people, and honestly, it's the only reason that any of us are here. Our relationships cascading down into us believing in Jesus and following him. And so, after this instruction, when Apollos wants to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encourage him to go for it. They send letters with him. And when he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate which had to drive them completely up the wall that some dude named Apollos is taking their scriptures and proving that Jesus is the Messiah that they don't want to believe. And proofs from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. So you got a guy who went from teaching accurately with great fervor to refuting Jewish opponents vigorously in public debate. So the relationships carry on. And now we're going to bring everything together with a little story. So, there, I can even see everybody. So back when I was in high school and decided that, kind of in fits and starts, that, that I was gonna follow God. So I started reading the Bible every night. And I'm sure you guys have never done this, you know, where you like read the Bible for, you know, a month and a half, and then you're off for three months, and then you're back on for two weeks, and you know, back off for two months, and then you're on again. For, right, so that's like most of high school. But I was intent on seeking God, you know, seeking, keep on seeking, like we were reading way back at the beginning. And 
I wanted more of God, and I couldn't have said, you know, exactly what that was. I just wanted more something to go here. And it apparently worked, because in looking for a college, obviously prayed a lot about that, and when we got, we'd gone on one college tour and then uh, went to Rose Holman, and as we're driving in the entrance of Rose Holman, this is really my first experience of the Holy Spirit telling me anything, and it wasn't like, you know, words or voices or, you know, anything creepy, but as we pull in the entrance, me, my mom, and my dad, all at the same time, knew that that's where I was supposed to go to school, which starts a huge chain of things that ends up me sitting right here, and we don't have time for that either, but we all knew, and I don't know who spoke first, but we all just sat there and in the car, hadn't even made our first turn on campus, and said, this is it. And, you know, we went to the third place because we'd made reservations and, you know, kind of checked off that box, but this was it. Okay, so now fast forward, we've gotten up to my senior year. At the end of my senior year, I decided, I'm going to read the Bible every night, and no matter how late I've stayed up, it's okay, I can stay up a little more, I'm going to do this. And I did. I just decided, boom, this is how it's going to be. And so I get to, get to Rose, and there's these guys there from Rose Christian Fellowship, and they're helping the freshmen move in, which is really kind of helpful because I was on the third floor, and there was no elevator. And so they're helping do this, and my mom, bless her heart, is only a mom sending her first son to school can latched on to one of these Rose Christian Fellowship leader guys and made sure that he knew who I was and that I knew who he was and that I knew when the first meeting was going to be and that these relationships and connections had happened. So the first Friday that there's going to be a Rose Christian Fellowship meeting rolls around and I have decided that I am going to go to it. Now, you've got to understand that I am not a mingler. I do not mingle, I do not like walking into rooms of people that I don't know and making conversation and small talk or large talk or really any other kind of talk. Now, if you think I'm okay at that now, it's a matter of training and practice. It doesn't really have anything to do with preference. Well, back then, I wasn't any good at it and I didn't like it. But I have decided, like with reading the Bible, that you know what, I am going to do this. This is what I'm going to do. And so I go in there. And I walk in, and here comes this guy towards me, and he's kind of about my height and skinny and gangly and got like Coke bottle glasses on. And, and I mean, you know the kid you've gone to school with him. He's the one that gets picked like last or third to last in dodgeball. You know, you, you don't want him on your team. And here he comes, and he's smiling at me, not just with his mouth, but also which is, with his eyes, which now in retrospect I recognize as being the Holy Spirit. And he just says, hi and welcome, and shakes my hand, and says a couple small things, and that was it. And then he was gone and went off to talk to other people. And he did that for the first, I don't know, six, seven, eight, 10, 12 weeks, something like that. When I came, there was going to be someone that would say hello. And for me, that was you know, all I needed to get me from this to this. And, you know, it's just, just this, this little, little thing that happened. And so if you haven't been to, if you don't go to Connections Time, I would challenge you to go ahead and do it, you know, even if you're kind of like this about it. Hopefully someone will be friendly and give you smiles and say hello. And start building these relationships because we need each other. You know, the kids are talking about all of these things that were so cool that they did together. You know, going to water parks and, and going camping and, of course, Connor says, Christmas! But, you know, it's more fun together. Seriously. So, start coming to Connection Time. The other thing is, if you either haven't come to any growth groups or you haven't been in a long time, reconsider because it's completely different from this. Okay, admittedly, sometimes I am teaching, not all the time, 
but it's a lot less me talking and it's sillier. So it's really not so bad. So think about these things and you know, got power? Just ask because there are things that you can do that God has for you that are much smaller than you think that could accomplish much more than we could possibly imagine. Let's pray. God, thank you for your spirit and that you live in us and that you work with us where we are at with who we are today. Thank you, Lord, that you aren't leaving us where we are. And that you want to build us up, Lord, through your spirit, through your power, through your word, and through relationships with other people who know you. God, extend the reach of our relationships, extend the reach of our words, extend the reach of our Facebook pages out into a world that needs you, God. Keep thinking of the song, Shine, Jesus, Shine. Fill this world with the Father's glory. Praise, raise, praise, Spirit, praise. Set our hearts on fire. God, fill the nations with mercy. And let there be light. Let there be light everywhere we go. By your grace and for your amazing glory, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.